going live. Okay. All right, we should be live. So hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome to the second day of the Yaya Nordic Wired Conference. Uh, thank you very much to everybody that joined us yesterday. It was a super nice day. We had some really brilliant panels taking place. Uh, loads of people using the networking tools and hanging out. It was really cool. Um, so thank you for joining us. If you've missed any of the sessions and you were only here today, please head to the expo section that you'll find in the menu on the left-hand side of your screen at some point because we've uploaded things from yesterday there. Um, so you can revisit everything. And as things are going on throughout the day, we'll be uploading all of the sessions that we have ongoing too. So if you missed anything, don't panic. You can find it in the expo section. Um, so I'm very, very happy to welcome Tom Keel of UK Music today. He's gonna be kicking off our initial sessions of the day, which are all going to focus on my least favorite topic in the entire world, Brexit. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Tom. And yeah, if you've got any questions, please put them in the stage chat just to the right of the screen. Lovely. Thank you, Francine. Um, and thank you for welcoming me to this, um, to this conference. And as, as Francine said, um, for us British, um, Brexit is becoming that, that a slightly tired issue now, but obviously it's, it's incredibly important um, to, uh, to us and, and particularly our, our music market in, in particular. It's now something like um, over four and a half years since the initial referendum result, um, and it's taken us a long, a long time to, to get to um, the point where we are now. The UK obviously left the European Union formally at the big end of January this year, um, that's taken uh, three prime ministers to get us to that point, two general elections uh, and a lot of political uncertainty. Um, this year, leaving COVID aside, has uh, would have been, I think we would have in, uh, thought that this would have been the most dominant issue that we would have been dealing with. Um, UK Music is a lobbying body and or, an organisation which represents um, the sector to parliament and, and, and to government. And our, our intentions at the beginning of the year with, with Brexit would have been the, the big big priority in getting the, um, a, a, the um, achievements and getting the, the, the points uh, across to ensure the sector continue to flourish with the new new circumstances. Um, obviously, COVID has put a, 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 a huge um, uh, effect and have a, a very devastating impact on, on, on the lives and music sector in particular. And I think it's the live sector um, where we where we um, envisage a lot of the challenge, most of the challenges um, from Brexit, at least immediately biting as as well. Um, the, uh, as we kind of reach the end of the year and the the transition period uh, for our membership of um, the um, economic area uh, is expires at the end of this month, we're really at a very crucial time at, at the moment. Um, this is um, a, a big challenge uh, for us. Um, the uh, big news, I think, at the moment is that the, the talks are going at a very a, a crunch stage between the EU, EU institutions and the, and the UK, UK in terms of that future uh, trade agreement um, and what that looks like. Um, I, in fact, just before this presentation, I, I, I was slightly nervous that I might need to um, re readjust and re-edit my, my comments in light of some, some white smoke maybe coming out of um, those institutions. Um, so um, I did check in very recently and I don't think there's been a deal yet. But what we are expecting is that there could be a deal imminently um, regarding um, our, our future relationship. And it does it does need to happen probably in the next couple of days. There's a, a process that needs to go through Parliament and also through um, the European Union institutions as well to agree any kind of um, extension or uh, beyond the, the tran transition period. The UK government has been, been clear that it does not want an extension to the transition phase. Uh, and uh, so it really is a, a crunch time. So. Um, I, I apologise if, if what I'm presenting today may go slightly out of date with, with new information that may come out in, in, in the coming days. Um, but that said, I hopefully what I'll be giving you is a, is a very broad uh, outline of what to expect um, if you were working with the UK music market in 2021 and the kind of new, new changes 
that, that might be affected. Some of these concepts may be familiar to you, some of them may be less familiar to you. I've got a little uh, presentation um, that I will um, run through first, and then I'm sure if it, on the, the chat function, if there's particular questions or areas where you would like me to um, de delve in a little bit more deeply, I'm very happy to, to elaborate and go a little bit further. So I'll just try and share my screen now and get that so this is my presentation about the brexit key keynote um so just to give put my organization a little bit in context uk music is the umbrella body for the commercial music industry in the united kingdom and um, we represent all the various component strands of the music sector uh, so some of the we're essentially a trade body of trade bodies and we've existed for um, around um, 12 years now. And um, we represent independent record companies through AIM, the major record companies and independent companies through the BPI, the Featured Artists Co Coalition representing artists, the Ivers Academy representing composers, um, the Music Managers Forum representing managers, Music Publishers Association representing publishers, Music Producers Guild representing studios and producers, Musicians Union, um, PPL and PRS, two collecting societies, and UK Live, the live live sector more more, more broadly. So we're a globally unique organisation uh, in that we bring together very compo many component strands. Um, we focus on research, we focus focus on data, we focus on lobbying and, and prioritizing the sector uh, in, 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 that, in that regard. So we're, um, uh, Brexit has been the dominant issue uh, for the last four or five years and, until COVID broke in terms of a lot of the work we've been doing. We talk very regularly to government, UK government, about our priorities and the policies that we need to ensure that the, the, the UK has the right framework to develop a, a successful uh, music industry and can continue to grow and flourish in, in, in whatever kind of challenges that it, that it may face. So it's, a, it's an important time and Brexit does really um, challenge the way that we have traditionally um, worked and, and the, the sector has, has developed. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of context in terms of the size of the, um, the, the UK music mar market. In terms of um, its economic contribution, it's worth 5.8 billion to the UK economy, exports generated 2.9 billion, and we employ around 200,000 people. Um, the sector broadly, we, we capture though the sector in, 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 in that way. Um, I think one thing to estimate, uh, uh, emphasize particularly in, in terms of employment, is that um, most of the people in the sector, 72% of the, of the sector, are, um, are self-employed. Uh, and um, that, again, puts a, a huge challenge when dealing things with like COVID and Brexit, because it's not just about big companies and it's not just about big organisations. Yes, there are some big organisations, big companies, which are, are in crucial to the, the UK market, but, but the vast majority of people working in the sector and generating that that GBA and export value are uh, are actually either SMEs, small and medium enterprises, or or are um, um, of a much smaller scale. So it's uh, um, we're we're a, a growing sector and have grown uh, for for a number of years. Um, those figures uh, don't take into account the impact of COVID. We estimate around about a three billion uh, potential cut in our, our GBA alone from everything that's happened this year. Um, so, given the the current restrictions that are, that are in place and the inability to get back to like live events, that has present, present a, a, a big challenge to our to our sector. But uh, we have been, as I said, working with with ministers to ensure both COVID and and, and Brexit uh, the, the the challenges that it, that are, are that are faced, uh, the mitigations uh, can be put in in place so we can uh, continue to to grow. So, kind of turning to to where we are with with Brexit, um, I like to kind of present this in terms of: Are we now, as we kind of reach the end of the transition period, are we at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? Um, as of early uh, December 2020, um, there is currently no clarity about that particular relationship, although I do envisage we will get that soon. If a deal is reached, um, we actually expect it probably will be broadly based on very essentials only deal. 
Um, the UK government has been clear that it, it wants to um, agree some kind of reciprocal arrangement around things like touring, um, but we, we don't necessarily have confidence that, that the level of detail that, um, that will be required in, in any kind of free trade agreement, particularly the way it's being negotiated at the moment, will give us sufficient uh, comfort uh, and, and, and at this point in time. So we do wait to see what will happen. And I think what will probably happen is that um, the early part of um, 2021 uh, will still be um, kind of testing the water somewhat, whether um, with the new arrangements and how that impacts our sector. And I think that will be incredibly um, important. Obviously, there's a further dynamic as well with the issues around COVID taking place. Um, and actually that um, the fact that very few limited live events are, are taking place uh, may mean we don't really properly get to, to test the new uh, the new um, uh, arrangements after the, at the end of the year in, in the normal way that we would have essentially hoped for. So we're definitely going to have to watch this um, watch this space and see and see how that materialises. But there are certain things that we do know about um, how how people will enter the UK. Uh, uh, for touring purposes, for for creativity and, and music um, uh, purposes too, and then and then and then they, this will provide that 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 framework. Um, we've been making it very clear that musicians and crews should be very um, e e expressly addressed within within the agreement, and we'll um, we are awaiting the outcome of those discussions. On each of these slides, I do actually have links to to various. Um, hyperlinks to various government sources and actually why would um hopefully these slides will be circulated after this presentation because um i think it'd be good for people to kind of keep up to date with um these links because government will be periodically updating this over the course of this month um just as uh, december um started at the beginning of this week um i was inundated with loads of messages from the government about new resources and new details and i think these um these um uh, these hyperlinks will be probably quite crucial, I think, for people to refer to in terms of like navigating the um, the UK market and what what may and may may change. Um, so so please do um, refer to them because I think the material will be updated and and, and presented as, as as time wears on. So for touring musicians, um, we have been making the clear argument that the musicians need to be able to tour internationally to sustain their career, careers and without cumbersome work permit arrangements. Um, this is also true of the, the wider sector too, not just about performers we recognise as crew, there's, there's managers, te technicians and engineers who perform a substantial part of that. And so it's important for us to, to ensure that they, uh, they receive parity in, in terms of the protections um, that, that exist. Up until the end of uh, this month, um, we, we still enjoy freedom of movement to perform anywhere in the, in, in the EU. Uh, without specific work permission um, and and conversely that that is reciprocal as well so European Union artists um, are able to come to the UK K2 uh, under the, the similar processes and similarly I think it's it should be highlighted about how UK is, is a great destination for um, for recording music as well um, studios such as Abbey Road and Air but also um, Rack and um, Metropolis Studios these are these are world uh, beating um, uh, studios and they attract international talent to, to, to perform in them and um, the sort of arrangements we need to get in place um, and to enable people to come to the country to, to perform and record uh, are, are, are parallel. Um, however, there is a challenge I think in terms of our ability to continue to tour overseas uh, in, in the sense that the European Union there is no uh, harmonisation uh, regarding um, work permits um, so we uh, are looking, uh, obviously that has been one of our central arguments is to actually have some kind of alignment, which will then uh, mean that um, we don't have to have a situation where if you enter one state, then, then you tour and, and, and then say you're, you're performing in Amsterdam one night and then you're performing in um, Paris the next, that, that we're then having to, to navigate various different um, uh, work permit systems. So that's been the central thrust of our of our arguments. So that kind of takes me swiftly on to the, the reason works permit issue um, and we're continuing to work on, on, on that. Um, we, we, we hope and expect that um, we will be considered by most European Union nations, our artists and performers as non-visa non nationals. 
Um, and we have legislated in 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 the the UK now to to make sure that EU musicians and people coming from the EU area um, are, are considered as non-British nationals too. So the, we have had a piece of legislation that's been going through Parliament this year, which has changed our immigration rules. Essentially, what that means is that the the existing provisions that apply to people coming from, say, the United States or, or Canada. Uh, will now apply to uh, people coming from uh, from from European Union countries and associated countries, uh, and so that is um, uh, something I will develop a little bit a bit more um, into next. So one of the most common areas uh, for people coming for creative and performance purposes is under the what's called the temporary worker creative and sporting visa tier five. For this, you need something called a certificate of sponsorship. So it could be a promoter, it could be an agent, uh, and uh, it could be someone who's, who's, who's registered to issue those certificates of sponsorship. These generally need to be applied within three months uh, before the, the work starts, so uh, whether it's the performance or the recording, uh, and decision generally takes three weeks. Um, it's around about £244 per applicant, and dependents uh, would also need to take that, that fee. If, if you are coming to the, the UK for a, 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 if it's more short notice that you, you need to get a, a quicker decision that, that you can get an expedited service in order to get to the tier five um, between 500 and 800 pounds. They, they last for up to 12 months um, or uh, on the, whatever the period you, you've designated for your certificate plus, plus 28 days. So you may only need say a, a short period where you're coming over to the uk for but um so it can be slightly more more contained and, and, and condensed in in that that way than uh than, than than otherwise so the temporary worker visa is um is is what is considered to be probably the most most common i think for for professional um really sort of organized um live events so your big arena tours your big um stadium of events will probably generally go through that that process um, and it is generally seen to be the most uh, trusted and uh, accepted well obviously it's, it's probably the more expensive route into the into the, in the into the country too um, so going to, on to the second area where people also come and and utilize a an entry point into the UK um, if you've been invited by an organization for, for paid work, you can get what is called a, a permitted paid engagement. Um, the, you, this, again, you need to be applied for generally from three months before that, um, uh, the period when your engagement takes place and decision generally take about, about three weeks. Um, it costs about 95 pounds and allows you to stay up to a month. So it is a more limited, short, shorter period of time. Um, but it obviously is it is it is cheaper. So for some um, more um, kind of less pro pro professionally developed, maybe acts and artists, maybe people starting out, um, it can be a, a more attractive route to go down that. The problem that we have encountered um, with this this route is that sometimes border force don't quite fully understand it in the way that and um, they do the tier five system. Um, so you do need to have a lot of evidence, the data and evidence in terms of like the, the paid engagement you're coming over over for. So um, we have been talking to the government about getting some tweaks and, and reforms to that 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 process so that it is generally more more accepted because of, it kind of um, offers a, an entry point to the to the to the the market that that is otherwise. Um, could be more limiting uh, for those on, on more um, uh, small, smaller uh, budgets and, and, and funds. A third area I kind of wanted to highlight was called is another area is if you're playing at a say a, a, a one of the big main main festivals as well is something called permit free festivals. So there's, if you are a festival in the UK, you can apply to be on the agreed list of um, permit free festivals, so that you don't have to navigate the points based. Um, immigration system your, your, yourself and you can issue permits for for performances so festivals such as WOMAD, Glastonbury, Reading, Leeds, Isle of Wight, Barbican uh, are on these um, on these lists and um, they need to be established for at least three years have an audience of around about 15,000 people uh, and uh, to be taken 
taken forward. So there's, those are kind of what I would see is for the short term visitors, so those people coming uh, for a shorter period of time, you're probably likely to take one of those two, three, one, two or three routes. And regardless of the outcome of the Brexit negotiations uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming days, this is now the UK law that essentially this, this applied to Americans and Canadians, et cetera, previously, and that now effectively has been, been, been um, extended to the, the EU uh, market and uh, people and residents uh, too. For more longer term periods of, of work, there is the, what, uh, there's been some reforms as well. There's also something called the tier two visa, um, which relates to skilled workers. Um, this generally um, there is a, a, a shortage occupation to this. So if you're working with orchestra players and that maybe uh, they are and have traditionally been on the um, shortage occ occupations list. So the orchestras themselves, you could have Norway or, or Sweden could maybe have the, um, the most, most talented um, uh, um, a violinist in, 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 the in the world. And there may be a lack of um, uh, uh, similar standard quality in, in the UK, and so the, the justification is that there's a, that's a, 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 a further entry route where you can uh, can come in. Uh, similarly, there's a, also a reform of something called the Global Talent Visa. Um, these are these are, and that's people who have out, outstanding and exceptional talent. Um, we've been very critical as an organisation about. Um, that moves to, towards that extent, exceptional talent, and and because it generally implies skills, which can be evidenced by qualifications. Similarly, it, it also implies um, salaries of a, of, a, of a certain level. And our experience of working with the music industry and musicians is that that just generally it may work for other sectors, but it, that's just how it doesn't generally work for for the music industry. You have a very talented or brilliant guitarist but they may not be able to read music and I think that's 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 a problem for us so we've been very critical of um, a, a points-based system that, which looks at skills and, and, and talent in, in such a way but this is what I'm focusing on here is much more the kind of longer term if you're coming to the UK for for a period of two or three years or, or relocating on that that basis um, you'll be more likely to use those those visa systems um, rather than the, the, the previous three that I mentioned. Similarly, um, I thought it'd be helpful if, if you're working for people, uh, maybe nationals from, um, from, from, from EU countries, but actually um, uh, if you're already, who are already based in, in the UK, a further change that has happened, and this was actually put in place last year when we were facing the prospect of no deal Brexit taking place then, there's something called the EU Settlement Scheme. So if you have been resident in the UK uh, for uh, around five years continuously, you can apply for settled status. Um, that is um, essentially open still until the 30th of June 2021. So beyond the, um, the, the um, transition phase e expiring, um, that's a free to apply to. So that essentially gives um, residential rights to to those who who've been living there. You can also get pre-settled status. So if you've only moved to the UK in the last two or three three years, you will also be able to um, benefit from that um, scheme if if you were to apply for. But that obviously that helps with with jobs uh, and 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 security there uh, in, in terms of having um, that that status in in place once we um, once the transition phase is out of the way. I kind of wanted to highlight as well um, the UK nationals overseas considerations. So those visiting the EU from the UK will need to ensure their passport is less uh, is less than ten years old and has at least six months front to it. So basically, when when we um, Brexit finally at the end of the month, they, these are considerations that will need to be put in place. If you're working for with musicians from the, the UK um, and but you're you're wanting to work with them on tours or or events. Uh, overseas, you will need to ensure that they that they have those um, qualifications in in in, in place. Um, work per present time work permits uh, and visas for business trips may need to be navigating different entry requirements. So the, one of our big concerns, as I highlighted, was this kind of Amsterdam Paris issue about different places. So we still don't have that um, that certainty. So if you're working with UK artists, that's something that will need to be um, uh, uh, bottomed out. And we're trying to get as much information ourselves as an organisation in terms of the various different work permits and visa systems uh, that, that may exist. Um, that generally seems to be more 
more more work permits than than visas do, but but it doesn't see that that will have an increase in costs and in bureaucracy for our ability to tour overseas. Uh, and and similarly, UK nationals living uh, in the EU have have rights protected under under the withdrawal agreement uh, uh, for for um, uh, and enabled to actually uh, take up their their residency overseas as well, similar to the EU settlement scheme. I've largely dealt with people there, and that's obviously we are a people um, industry, and in music and creativity is very based on um, and people and, and and nurturing that that creativity. But it's important to recognise as well that that Brexit doesn't just mean changes to the way people can can move between borders, but it also means how goods and equipment in particular. And I understand for, you'll be learning a little bit more in some of the other sessions I think today about about carnets and. Some of you already may be very well used and disposed to to using the Carnet system, um, but at the moment we're it's um, we're expecting to to be having to to navigate a system. Um, essentially, the Carnet would mean that you have to enter um, you you take into a a, a territory jurisdiction um, and leave with essentially what you what you came in with, and it's ensuring that. Um, there's a doc documentary evidence of that, say that you're not essentially um, passing on goods uh, on the way we, when you've been through a, a destination. So generally, they it, it costs around £325 to apply for a carnet for up to six months or two months. Um, it uh, applies. Um, we un understand that it um, once it should be stamped once when entering the UK and, and once when leaving. So, so we don't envisage that you necessarily will need to do it in each and every individual states. At least that's the information that we've been given from the government at the at, at the moment. At the moment, it's possible there may also need to be a, a carnet system, but operating between the UK, um, well, essentially Great Britain, the mainland Great Britain, and, and then Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland will is obviously a very contentious area with regards to Brexit um, because of the the nature of its territorial issues and and historical relationship with 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 um, a Republic of Ireland as well. Um, and so um, that is one of the main challenges i think with the the Bre brexit settlement and because of that although the government has explicitly said that there will be a requirement to have a carnet options for carnets between northern ireland and the rest of the mainland britain uh, uh, may be uh, required so that has a further potential implication uh, for touring another aspect of goods is regarding uh, musical instruments uh, and the cites convention which the uk is a, a signatory to uh, the UK has uh, protects endangered species and musical instruments, um, which may be made made up of of that. So, if a musical instrument contains a list of cites, um, list of species, and it's not been exempt, they also be required uh, to have certification of movements. Um, but ATA carnets cannot be used as an alternative to to cites documents. So, there's uh, a further issue there to, for consideration with certain uh, performance uh, musical instruments. Merchandise. Um, so from 1st of January, you'll need to make a customs declaration when importing goods from the EU and vice versa. So if you're a touring musician, this will include selling merchandise, including physical music products such as vinyl, um, CDs and T-shirts and gigs. I mean, on the plus side, uh, generally, um, physical media is applied at, at zero tariffs for WTO terms. So even if the de declarations are required, um, there shouldn't be levies on physical media such as CDs and, 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 and vinyl just because of the nature that is. So that would apply even if even if you don't get a deal or in a no deal situation in, in the coming coming days and weeks, we 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 don't have to uh, shouldn't have to apply that on that particular form of merchandise. Nonetheless, there will be customs declarations that that, that will will be required for the merchandise element. Other considerations too. Um, it's unlikely at this stage that, it's, that, that there will be a possible UK trade agreement which will cover fully the social security arrangements, um, particularly around double taxation. Um, as I said, the, at the beginning of this, the presentation, the focus is very much on on kind of like the, the high level, and that this may need to be addressed fully in a, in a further stage. And so, without this clarity, um, the government is suggesting that um, uh, A1 forms, which do exist at, at, at present, will be will be required, and that's something. Um, so, it's just to ensure that you you're having the right deductions at Social Security 
uh, are being taken place for for performance and, um, and recorded work. I also think another area which is incredibly important to the music instruments an issue which binds all our all our members is is copyright law. It, it, it enables creators to um, have um, economic remuneration innate for their creativity. It enables businesses to invest in their their creativity too. Um, it's a national right that's largely harmonised in international treaties, and UK is a signatory to most of those um, uh, treaties and uh, agreements. Um, we have generally um, legislated to ensure this con continues to stay in force in 2021. So there's been various changes to our law over the last few years, which have basically been um, re reapplying the, the, the existing EU legal framework. That's, that said, the EU framework provides a very strong level of protection for the, for the UK. Um, and uh, there was a concern among some in the music industry without that, that levels of protection that we do um, run the risk of um, uh, being uh, potentially challenged by uh, uh, our, our framework and potentially being watered down. UK Music as an organisation took a, a legal action against the government a, a few years ago regarding of not giving compensation to, to, to creators to change copyright law um, to do a private copying. Um, we won that case, but the larger reason we won that case was because it, what the UK government was doing was not compliant with, with EU law. So with it will be much harder for us to take a similar type of action in, in future or to be successful um, without um, those that EU protection. So a potential strong battle for us as an organisation is to um, to continue um, that that fight and ensure that we, we have a robust and in fact what, framework. In fact, one of the main positives and objectives we actually have been making to government is to actually say, say well the ip framework uh, is incredibly important to the industries the creative industries as a whole this and brexit needs to be about opportunities um so isn't this an opportunity to actually for us to uh, develop our our, our 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 legal framework even further so that we have even stronger protections so i mean i think some in government are are, are disposed to that position too so so we could see actually a, a great strengthening of, of copyright law uh, uh, in in the UK too. So it doesn't necessarily follow that it automatically has to be to be weakened, but it, we undoubtedly feel that there is potential there, and we're, we're as an organisation we're preparing for that that battle. That's kind of it for me in terms of my my presentation. But I'm really happy to um, to take any. Any points that might be addressed? I hope that's stimulated everybody. <laughs> thank you, well, thank you so much for that, Tom. That's, I mean, there's so many different considerations and so much information that people really do need to be aware of. So that was such a helpful overview of everything. So thank you very much. Um, if you're happy for us to do so, then we'd love to make the slides available to everybody that's here so if you'd be able to send them to me i can add them to the expo section um that we have again on the left hand menu if everybody's watching that um great i think we are just about to jump into our session so tom very very helpfully mentioned uh, some things around carnets and around visas we've got a lawyer from um oh my god Latitude Law, sorry, my head is in a thousand places right now. We have a lawyer called Gemma from Latitude Law that's gonna be joining us in one of the Q&A rooms in the sessions section in about five minutes time. Um, and we have Colin from Rocket Cargo that's gonna be joining us to discuss cargos and merch, uh, carnets and merchandise um, over in another of the sessions. So if uh, when we finish with this session, if everyone could please make their way to the sessions button on the left-hand side. Um, then you'll be able to join those rooms. We have very, very limited space in those rooms. So if you're not able to get in, then please place any questions that you have in the event chat and we'll make sure that they're asked. We're recording each of the sessions. So we'll then put these conversations into the expo section so everybody can find all of the answers to everything that we've been discussing in there today. And you'll also be able to find Tom's keynote in there in a few minutes when I've managed to download it and upload it. Um, so thank you very much for your time, Tom. Really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Um, Lovely, thank you. And to everyone else, we will see you in the sessions. Bye. <laughs>